everybody. Uh, thank you for uh, attending a, a session uh, with this really short title. Uh, why resource management continues to be on top of the two hard power and how to get it off. Um, I'm uh, Lindsay Scott and this is... Eileen Roden. Um, and we're from uh, PMO Flashmob. Uh, how many of you have come across uh, PMO Flashmob before? Okay, great. So hopefully uh, for the people that uh, haven't, you'll get a bit of a, a sense of what it is that we do. Um, and also for the people that do know us, great, nice to see you and thanks for coming along. So this session today, um, this uh, has come from this that we launched today, uh, this yesterday at the show. And what this is, um, is uh, what we call an inside PMO report. And essentially it comes from something that we do on a, uh, twice a year called a PMO manager's lunch. And essentially we get practitioners together, PMO managers, and uh, invite them to a really nice restaurant, have lunch, lots of wine, and get them to talk about a particular subject um, and tell us about their experiences, which we then take and create something for you all to read and enjoy. So, first one we did is portfolio management, and that's available on the website if that's something that interests you. This is the second one, and it's resource management. And the reason why we went for resource management is because of this report, well, one of several actually, but more recently um, was a report from ESI, and now 2080 strategy execution made a report about the state of the PMO and one of the questions that they uh, were asking about PMOs and what is the biggest challenge that they have uh, and resource management came up again so it's not just because of this report actually there's a long line of reports from various different organizations that talk about the fact that PMO uh, has a problem with re resource management and we definitely know that from anecdotal evidence of people coming along to PMO flash mobs uh, and, and talking about this subject. So um, we thought, let's get together, have lunch, and um, let's see whether we can get into some details that might help other practitioners. So there's textbooks out there, but this is the real thing. This is what people are actually doing around resource management. So uh, in the summer, we were at the top of the Gherkin, inside, obviously, um, and they sat around a table, and you can find out who those people are in the report as well. We can actually find some of them in the audience as well, so yes. if you kind of you, you yes. look at the photograph again and one you here. can find them. One there. Uh, one there. Yes. <laughs> There's a couple here. Yeah. So, one of the things that we do is we, we get people to talk about what they're actually doing and how they've actually made it happen. Uh, and one of the things that we found kind of quite interesting, when we did the portfolio management lunch, we, um, we went out and asked, uh, and we knew a number of people who'd kind of implemented portfolio management and had done a really good job. So we had lots of practitioners to call on. When we went out and asked people, um, have you done resource management really well? We had hundreds of responses saying, no, but we would really like to find out what you talked about because actually we want to learn from that. So the 12 people that we actually kind of got sitting around the table all had various elements that they'd put into that. So we took all of that and we kind of took it away and we kind of reiterated a few times uh, and had some further kind of conversations and discussions. And we came up this thing called um, what we've called the circle of resource management. And depending on the organisation and kind of how you approach it, it can either be a vicious circle and just things feel really, really bad and really, really difficult, or actually you can get it into a virtuous circle where it becomes a really kind of effective and efficient process within your organisation. And in terms of the, the circle of resource management, what we identified was three individual segments. The first segment was at portfolio level. So lots of organisations who um, appear to do lots and lots of projects are really struggling about doing capacity management. What kind of individuals do we need? How many do we need? When do we need them? Whether our timeline is 12 months, 24 months or, or 5 years, whatever that kind of horizon is for their portfolio, they were really struggling with identifying what they required and there are a whole number of kind of tools processes that you can play around with in terms of being able to do efficient forecasts making sure we understand what the prioritization is the split between projects and other businesses usual at work and kind of how do we move from kind of where we are to kind of understand 
are fit from what's currently going on, bearing in mind that will continue to change over that five-year timeline. So that was the first segment. We've got a number of, kind of, as I say, a number of, kind of processes and tools that we use within that particular segment. The second segment that organisations are interested in tends to be down at the project level. So this is where I've got 327 projects this year. I've got two project managers, three BAs and a couple of techie guys. How do I actually allocate those individuals to projects? How do I know what tasks they've been working on? How do I know what their utilisation is? How do I recharge them and how do I balance them off against the costs? that it actually costs the organisation in order to have those. And if I bring a contractor in or a consultant in, how do I balance off those costs with potentially kind of some of the, the utilisation of the, of the people who are already there? So again, down at that kind of project level, that allocation either kind of to projects or individual tasks, how do we do that and make sure that's effective? So that will be the second segment within that circle of resource management. So when we were um, talking about the, uh, the supply and demand side, so all the way through that lunch, uh, there was a lot of talk about trying to get to grips with the, you know, trying to understand what the business wants, but it was always about the supply and the demand. But one of the other parts of the, um, the circle was obviously around capability. You know, there's a lot of people around that table that were interested in how their project management uh, resource pool uh, are being skilled, uh, there's a lot of talk around uh, the things like the uh, assessments, the competency framework type work. One of the really interesting things that got a lot of uh, agreements around the table was this problem around things like job titles, job roles, job families. Uh, one particular uh, PMO manager of a lag organisation, they're trying to do resource management where they've got something like 150 different names for a project manager. It's just things like that that kind of you don't get in a resource management textbook. And this is the kind of stuff that you can, you can find out from the, from the report. But you can see from the capability side, you know, it, says it was a nice, yes, there was a lot of talk about things like timesheets. In fact, you know it's going to be a good lunch when somebody says, in our organisation, the word timesheet is a dirty word. So you can imagine from that point exactly where the conversations between people are going to go. But it was nice to be able to focus on this side, the more of the, the capability side, which of course was not just about the project management people within the organisation, but also from themselves. So it's a PMO capability as well. So again, it was uh, bringing together the whole circle of supply, demand, and then of course the capability. We also, from this uh, discussion, and why it took so long, this lunch in July last year, we were supposed to bang this out a month later. And now what are we, March? We finished this report about three weeks ago to get it printed and get it here. The problem that we had is because the stuff that they were talking about is just not so straightforward. So we've got these circles and these parts, but also a lot of the conversation was about the context and the culture. This has a big bearing on how and where you start, also how are you going to tackle it, but what are you going to tackle, that kind of thing. So, for example, there was context. Now, what I want you to do in this next bit is to give you some ideas about what we're talking about in terms of context. And what I'd really like to see you do is stick your hand up if any of these resonate with you and your organisation at the moment. So these were the ones that they came up with. Bearing in mind, this lunch was about three hours long. Yeah, so we can I go through some of these things quite quickly. So there's a context of which their business is in, had a big bearing on, obviously, how and where and resource management. The other one was the culture. So there's a culture of the organization. So for example, that organization that was saying about timesheets, it's a dirty word. So these are some of the other things that they were talking about. And we know for a fact that a lot of PMOs have exactly the same kind of things. So again, culture, really tricky in terms of being able to try and understand what your culture is. It was a great um, uh, interesting insight to say from a PMO point of view, would you be able to articulate how culture is impacting some of your resource management services that you would offer? Do you have that insight? Have you actually even thought about 
those kind of things. So how do context and culture actually impact on some of the services you do, which resource management is just one of them. And of course, resource management being in this uh, report is about the people side. So the resource management of, of people. And I think the overarching thing about all of this is that because people are involved, that's why it's tricky. So those were some of the cultural things that they were talking about. So a question back to you would be, when you go back to your organisation, would you be able to pinpoint what are some of the cultural things that either um, help you do resource management well or will hinder? Just a question for you to think about. So probably the bit that kind of people are really interested in is, well, well we kind of know that. Yes, we've kind of, we recognise some of those problems. Uh, one of the things that we try to ascertain through some of this kind of assimilation of, of a number of people around the table, we're saying, well, actually, what is the problem? Yes, if you're all doing kind of bits of it and you've all done kind of it kind of well, what were the original kind of challenges and what, apart from the kind of the cultural and the contextual uh, impact on what's going to be delivered, what's the underlying problem? And although we've kind of articulated these three different segments of resource management, the problem is most organisations, actually, there is an initial driver for only one of those segments. Yes? So they say we want to put in some, uh, some career pathing for our project and programme managers. So let's kind of start looking together about what that might look like. Hold on a minute. If I do that, actually what we need to know is what do we need next year? So actually... We need to be able to do, at least at the portfolio level, to look at what we're going to need so we train people in the right way. And actually then we need to know that we're using the right people on the project. So as soon as you start off in one segment, you end up going round into the other two before you actually feel comfortable enough to do it in that segment. Other organisations, so when I, was a, when I was at Cadbury's, when I was a size 8, we, uh, we were, went in... Don't laugh too loudly, that's rude. Um, when we, um, when we, did, we wanted to do capacity management, we wanted to know what projects are currently happening, what's our timeline for the next three to five years on our projects. And again, we struggled because we, did, well, part of that, we didn't know what was currently happening, but we didn't know the types of skills that we used on projects, and we didn't know kind of how they were being developed and what we were going to have in the next few years. So again, going around that kind of full circle, and this is what happens time and time again. And when you start looking into it, you kind of think, well, actually, I don't know where to start because I need all of it. I don't know kind of which place to start and what we've already got. And what we've got is kind of, is good in some aspects and not necessarily good in the other. So we end up kind of getting ourselves in a muddle and don't really start anywhere. So this is where we need to pull on. I don't know anybody was here with our talk that we did um, at the last project challenge around um, seven habits of highly effective PMO managers, one of which was actually about pragmatism and taking a kind of a, a much more kind of pragmatic view of what we can do. And part of the issue with a lot of kind of PM, PMOs, when they start looking at this, is they want a perfect solution. They want it to be the best that can be. We know we've got some detailed projects. We've spent a lot of time doing planning. Can we take the detailed project plans and then start thinking about kind of resource management. And you've actually got to kind of take a step back and think, actually, just enough is good enough to get you down that lane. You are never going to have a perfect solution where you have a kind of a, a competency framework with 120 competencies in, 600 different resources, each in different kind of stages of the kind of resource life cycle allocated to individual tasks, particularly if your project plan is down to kind of half-day task activities. You're not going to have that all in place. So it was quite interesting to listen to practitioners who've actually played with, uh, with um, resource management, actually saying, well, actually, we just took that kind of pragmatic view and we said, what's the most important to us and how can we start on that journey depending on kind of which segment we want to come in at? So if we're coming in at the portfolio segment, and it may sound really silly, but actually just understanding about do we actually need to think about all of the projects in that portfolio? Yes. Can we get around to just thinking about doing capacity planning against our top 20% of the projects where actually they're going to use 80% of the resources? And the other thing that we looked at 
is there a small number of characteristics that we can use around each of the individual projects that give us a first view of what the resource capability might be? Yes? So, uh, and, and, and one of our old kind of colleagues was very keen on, on, on who used T-shirt sizes, yes? How big's your project? Small, medium, large, extra large, extra, extra large. And if you've got some kind of stats, or even if you haven't, as a start of a 10, start thinking about, actually, typically a small project might run over two months and might have 15 resources with one project manager or one project manager and five resources. So at least you start getting some modelling of what that portfolio might look like. And very often, particularly when you're looking after some of the other segments, at a capacity planning level, getting that first picture allows you to start refining the data with some further characteristics further on down the line but coming into that it's understanding what those key characteristics are that you can actually start that modeling with so again typically um, it was types of projects it was the kind of the size of projects in terms of finances and typically the kind of the split of resources but not across complex resource models it was about relatively kind of straightforward high groupings of resources because that gave us a good enough picture in terms of volume for who needed to be in the delivery team going forward when we're coming in at the project level one of the kind of things that we want to do is understand how each of the resources are used on the project and actually what we found with some of the conversations we had is to actually kind of take a step back and forget about what the individual, uh, the individuals are actually doing and actually just think about the projects that they're working on. Yes, because if we've got a picture of what projects they're actually working on, yes, at least we've got an understanding how they're splitting their time, which helps us to validate the model we talked about from the portfolio section in terms of the various kind of sizes that we've got of our individual projects. Yes? And some of the things that we did uh, 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 historically was we actually looked at kind of what phase people were working on. So we split each project out, not into individual tasks, but actually just into the five phases of the project. So the detail we had for the project manager to work on was very different to the information that we used from a resource allocation perspective that fed into the portfolio management piece without compromising the tie-in between those two pieces of information. The other thing that came out down at project level is we're very keen to utilise particularly the planning tools that we have to do resource management. And very many of, of the tools that are out there embed the, pro the resource management piece into the planning technology, yes? So you can do kind of resources against tasks. So again, you're led down a level of granularity that you either kind of struggle to have the expertise to do at the project manager's level, it was my experience of the project managers, or to try and get any kind of consistent view or any kind of uh, continuity of information because that would change on a kind of a weekly basis that was happening. So again, kind of taking that out and you know, the, the tool that is continuously the tool of choice when we're starting out on this is spreadsheets. Now, spreadsheets may not appear to be the, the most sophisticated tool, but having personally done it on, on several very large programs and projects, it actually helps you truly understand the whole allocation process. And so, again, uh, the experience of the practitioners who sat around the lunch was whatever kind of process we use, actually kind of spreadsheets was the best way to get that picture of a high level view rather than going down into the detail for each of the individual projects and gave you some kind of consistent categorization of information that could be used for allocation. So coming in at the resource uh, segment, the, uh, the PMO managers uh, around the table talked through um, an, an approach, uh, various different approaches of which we tried to put together a kind of, um, not a step by step, but to give you some ideas about how they actually uh, tackle this part when they came into this part of the, uh, in the segment. So for example, um, starting uh, right at the beginning with, with uh, creating job families and job roles. So this came from those PMO managers that had struggled with the 150 different names for project managers. So trying to rationalise things across an organisation, whether large or small. 
So they also talked about um, getting into and understanding associated skill sets across their entire resource pool, which again led to a, a, a bit of discussion because of the different types of experience in, 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 in being able to do that. You know, we, we, we've got to remember that resource management is just one little piece of the PMO pie. So our skill and experience as a PMO practitioner need to be, if one minute you're looking at potentially career paths and job families for project management people, and then the next you're doing some reporting, the next you're doing some issues or whatever. So it's actually a small piece of what it is you're doing. So again, it's about trying to understand from, a, uh, from our point of view is what kind of skill sets as a PMO manager, a modern PMO manager has to have today, is suddenly you need to be knowing um, actually some parts of what is an HR role. Yeah? So it's quite interesting to listen to them about what they do and how, how detailed and how deep they go. One of the other things that, um, that they agree on is that actually there are competency frameworks and assessments that are out there. It's not about reinventing the wheel, but if there is a, a, a role and a, to be able to understand, well, how do you tailor those for your particular business and the kind of roles that you have within your organisation. So again, it was the, not about starting from scratch, but using what's already out there and then being able to adapt it and, and to flex. And actually, those two words, adaptability and flexibility, just kept coming up all the time. So one minute we had somebody that's a, you know, a large rail organisation, the next it was an housing association that were talking about essentially approaching this in the same way. So it doesn't matter what kind of industry you're in, this kind of stuff is actually quite generic. One of the other things uh, that we also talked about, again, is this HR thing. We got into this discussion about, well, actually, does the PMO need to actually go as far as owning the, the training budget? Because some of them did, some of them didn't. And actually, we talked about, and the question, which was actually in the report, was we asked the question, when is the right time for the PMO to make that step, make that case to the business, that actually, you need to be providing some kind of, or having the budget for training and development, because they were creating learning and development plans. They're putting together things like coaching and mentoring programs. Yeah? So there's a very interesting um, perspective to hear them talking about, actually, a lot of this stuff is the HR, the L&D uh, part of the business is actually coming in to an affecting part of the PMO service that they're offering. So one of the things that, uh, that was important to them, so as again, it's the ad adaption of the, uh, the things like the competency frameworks that are out there, they all agreed there's nothing, nothing around PMO uh, competency frameworks. And just as a side note, uh, we've got a flash mob this evening round the corner where actually we're going to uh, look at the PMO competency framework as part of the discussion around maturity, maturity. at organisational level, PMO level, but also the individual's level. So, you know, we talk about resource management, we've got to absolutely remember that the PMO is also a resource in this resource pool. And we equally need to know things, that, you know, we want a competency framework, we want to be able to be assessed, we want a career path and a learning development plan. So, it, the, the two parts of the conversation. So, in terms of kind of where we, where we ended up in some of our kind of conclusions, um, and, and I have to say, one of the things that became very clear by the time we got to the end of the lunch and the conversations that we had is that actually we've only really started kind of scratching the surface. So there were some kind of really firm conclusions that kind of came out from that which are in the report, which is about recognising that actually it doesn't matter which segment you start in, yes? but just kind of start looking at the problems that you're trying to address within your organisation. As Lindsay mentioned, they came up with them um, kind of from a context and, and a cultural perspective. And if you do want to do effective resource management around your organisation, that you will have to pick up some elements from every segment. The challenge is, is what is the minimum you need to do in each segment to make that whole circle work and, and what we've got in the report and what we've kind of just touched on and scratched the surface in this kind of 30 minute talk is some of those elements and the minimum level you can play at without going into kind of huge detail and detailed processes around each of those segments. As I say, what, what has come out of this is we're really interested now to take this research and kind of build up some kind of future research so we can actually start showing 
what a number of those circles look like in a whole range of different organisations. So we've got examples from the people who were at lunch with us to say we've done some kind of further talk, but the ho- hope is we can kind of build a more structured model so we can do some kind of assessment around how effective this is based on the various elements we've got in each of the segments of the circle of resource management. So that's where we're hoping to get to. Um, if anybody's interested in kind of helping us kind of go through that and, and feeding into that, the copies of the report are available at, you'll know the stand number. 132. 132, is which is just the other side. You'll see us um, in terms one. of the, from, a, from a PMO perspective. And hopefully what we're, what we're trying to do is just kind of lift the lid off that mystery that is resource management that people continue to struggle with.